Louis Bartas was a French infantryman in World War I, a poilu. Through his diaries and notebooks, we gain an extraordinary insight into life on the front lines, all told with his cutting insight and masterful wit. He writes about how abominable life in the trenches was, but he also reveals that despite the unimaginable horror, humanity always found a way to express itself. In the following extract, taken from his 12th notebook, covering July 13 to August 29, 1916, we learn what happens when French and German infantry get so close to each other that they realize their shared humanity. We also see the lengths that the officer class goes to in order to prevent that humanity from expressing itself. And as for the poilu that would have been posted to this particular death trap on the front line, so close to the German line, but imagine their astonishment their stupefaction to see the calm and tranquility which reigned in this area. Some smoked, others read, some wrote, and a few squabbled, without lowering their voices one note. And if these patriots, these slackers, had lent an ear, they would have heard the Germans coughing, spitting, talking, singing, etc., with the same lack of ceremony. Their stupefaction would have changed to bewilderment if they had seen the French and German sentries seated tranquilly on their parapets, smoking pipes and exchanging bits of conversation from time to time, like good neighbours taking some fresh air at their doorsteps. From relief to relief, we passed along the habits and customs of these outposts. The Germans did the same. Even if the whole champagne burst into flames, not a single grenade would fall in this privileged corner. During the day, I had come to reconnoitre the somewhat tangled road from this outpost, which was stuck at at least 400 metres away from the place where the rest of the section was located. Our section chief found himself there in conversation with a Fritz, who spoke fairly good French. He was saying that they were mostly Poles in this regiment, that they wouldn't surrender because the Germans would take it out on their families and their property. But this Pole suddenly indicated that someone was coming along the boyo, and he dropped down, calling out, Vive la Pologne! Vive la France! Sometimes there are exchanges of gifts, like packets of tobacco from Régie Française, the French government tobacco monopoly, which went to fill the big German pipes, or delicious German cigarettes which came over to the French side. We also exchanged lighters, buttons, newspapers, bread. Here was a crazy business of commerce and intelligence with the enemy, which would have stirred up the indignation of the patriots and super-patriots from the royalist Daudé to Clemenceau to the gunmen of Narbonne by way of the chameleon Hervé. It's a matter of taste. Some will consider this sublime, others will call it criminal. It depends on whether you place the ideal of humanity above or below the ideal of patriotism. You can be sure that this gesture of fraternity occurred in more than one place. In fact, wherever the proximity of outposts allowed it, and our big bosses, our leaders, had no illusions about it. If the trenches had been closer together, if they hadn't been separated by prickly barbed wire, hands would have reached out everywhere. Proof among a thousand that this horrible war had been unleashed, counter to the consent of the peoples. By whose pen will the next generation, struck with stupor, disconcerted by this universal sanguinary madness, learn about these acts of fraternity, which were like a protest, a revolt against the mortal fate which set, face to face, men who had no reason to hate each other? For the honor of our generation, of civilization, of humanity, may those who follow us have the truth revealed to them. For some, it will be a comfort. For others, an example, a lesson, a warning about the danger of launching a new war. That same day, from the outpost of a neighbouring company, a sergeant eager for promotion saw what was happening at outpost number 10. He wanted to throw a grenade at the German sentry who, without mistrust, stuck his head above the parapet. This sergeant was prevented by the outpost's occupants. Furious, he went off and denounced these acts to the commandant, who notified Lieutenant Breton, who was in charge of our company. He, in turn, called for our section chief, the ex-pastry chef Toulzon. It appears that your section, he told him, is up to some dirty business. They're chatting it up with the Bosch, is that true? Our adjutant, knowing that at the very least his stripe was at risk, swore that nothing abnormal was going on. 
but he warned me to keep my guard up for the next 24 hours that I was occupying the outpost, because it was probable that we would be closely watched by the big chiefs who would be ferocious, pitiless, if they found us in a flagrant delecto in conversation with the enemy. It's certain that a clever command could have profited from this opportunity to gain specific intelligence about the sector. The likelihood of poison gas attacks, the plans for blowing up mines or attacks or various positions. All that would be needed would be a few litres of pinard or a few quarts of hooch which the Germans lacked to loosen their tongues. But no one would have dared suggest this to our bosses. This would have been admitting the start of fraternisation with the enemy. A firing squad could well have been the response to such a suggestion. It's as if, in the time of the Inquisition, a poor fellow had confessed that he had just had a conversation with Satan. Given the incidents of the day, it wasn't without some apprehension that I took charge of this outpost, and I recommended clearly to the sentries that they not show themselves, that they not reply to calls or conversations made by our neighbours. They stay silent and vigilant. At the same time, I asked little Marcel, a Parisian as wily as a ferret, to keep a lookout to the rear in case we ourselves were being watched. I was comforted by the presence of Perriac's Paul Alpech, who, as a rationer, was exempt from guard duty, but who, considering the circumstances, told me that he would keep watch all night long and make sure that my recommendations were followed. An hour went by, and the summer night covered the champagne with a darkness which heightened the clarity of the legion of stars filling the sky with their tiny, silvery pinpoints. My spirits wandered off, far from the melancholy present. I contemplated this mysterious spectacle, and I asked myself, how many stars are there? A billion? Ten billion? Even without counting those which you can't see, and those which you can only see a hint of. And to think that, put together, all those numberless points of light give off less warmth and light than one ray of sunshine. Even the moon made them look pale and outshone almost all of them. And I told myself that all the hundreds and thousands of acts of war, of honor, of glory which people will celebrate in the history of this monstrous war won't have the same value as a single discovery useful to the good of humanity or a single invention by one savant. And I had these dreams as I moved along from one group of sentries to another, stationed at every ten paces along the boyo. Not a rifle shot disturbed the silence. In the distance you could scarcely hear the rumble of vehicles on the roads, or the huffing and puffing of the little putt-putt trains. When all of a sudden, young Marcel, who was watching the French side, arrived all out of breath and warned me that an officer, Sub-Lieutenant Loriot, armed with a revolver, had posted himself forty metres away. The whole squad was alerted. The four sentries who were at the end of the bio, facing the German outpost, turned a deaf ear to the persistent whistles which a Fritz, no doubt annoyed, made to call them. Not receiving any response, he sat on the parapet with a comrade and sent pipe smoke wafting towards us, doubtless peeved at our sulky silence. Eight or ten paces away from the group at the barricade, young P was on watch, a Gascon who was always boasting about how much more courageous he was than the others. As I passed near him, he cried out, Corporal, the Bosch, the Bosch, they're right there in the wire. At the same time, he threw a grenade, which I heard land with the same dull thud that a stone makes when it hits someone's shoulder or back. But either because of the clumsiness of the thrower or the bad quality of the grenade, there was no explosion. The Gascon had, I believe, in his confusion, forgotten to arm the grenade by striking it on his knee or another hard part of his body. He was already grabbing for a second one, but I stopped his arm and said to him, believing that he hadn't seen anything at all, But wait! Where are they? The Bosch! Climbing up to the firing step, I looked across the parapet and was quite astounded to see a human form, tangled up in the mass of barbed wire, apparently crawling towards our position. To tell the truth, this nocturnal rambler could have found a more comforting spot for his little walkabout. To come right up under the noses of the French and German sentries who could have easily seen him, he either had to be crazy or drunk. Qui vivre? I said in a half whisper. There was no response, but the intruder still approached, vigorously shaking the wire. Now he was only three paces from us. Qui vivre? I said again, now really alarmed. 
as I raised my rifle to my cheek and the sentry brandished a grenade. But this time, an angry voice came back. Leave me alone. Don't worry about me. It was the voice of Sub-Lieutenant Lohio of our company. A minute later, he jumped into the trench, revolver in hand. His breath stunk of hooch, and he was in a high state of excitement. Who threw the grenade in my face? He said. The sentry did his duty, I replied. Yeah, it's true, you're right, he agreed between hiccups. But you're lucky I didn't catch you talking with the Bosch. I was ready to kill you on the spot. Well, Lieutenant, you can see for yourself that there's nothing wrong, and that we're keeping good watch at outpost number 10. But the Lieutenant worked himself into a rage once again. I have to kill somebody tonight. I'm going to kill a German sentry. Show me where they are. The little Gascon had the clever idea to point to a mound of earth sticking up opposite the German outpost, saying, They're over there. The officer squinted uselessly into the darkness, holstering his revolver. He stalked off, muttering inarticulate and incoherent phrases and threats. The rest of the night passed by for us in painful recollection of this incident, which could have had a much more tragic outcome. As daybreak approached, the Germans called out to us. There were three of them, including a very young fellow with cheeks as rosy as a Fräulein. And they asked us if we had any coffee to drink. They told us that the day before, our artillery had killed two of their comrades. But I hastened to bring this conversation to an end. We told them about last night's incident and said they should keep from showing themselves as we were being so closely watched ourselves. The Germans, deeply moved, thanked us profusely before disappearing behind their sandbags. One of them clasped one hand in the other and cried out, Frenchmen, German, soldiers, all comrades, officers. And here he raised a clenched fist. No! Oh, how right he was, this German. It's true that you shouldn't generalize, but how many of our officers were more distantly separated, more morally estranged from us soldiers than were the poor German devils? who were being led to the same slaughterhouse despite themselves. To the corporal who came to take my place, I recommended that he be careful. But he wasn't careful enough, because the next day he was broken in rank. An indulgence they granted from the weakness of their case against him. He had committed the crime of not firing on the German sentries who showed themselves for an instant. The day after, with my squad, I went to occupy outpost number nine. These sentries stood guard at the end of a sap, which then wandered off towards enemy lines. What was the utility of these sentries? Stuck way out in this place where you couldn't see ten paces in front of you, nobody seemed to know. A little farther along the sap, the Germans had also posted a couple of sentries. They were too far apart to carry on a conversation, but not too far apart to observe each other through the loopholes, which were simply gaps in the parapet sandbags. Little by little, Both sides became more confident in the reciprocal interest of not firing upon each other, and they ended up showing themselves without challenge, exchanging a wave of camaraderie, a smile, a friendly look. Among those who haven't suffered through the crisis of the trenches, many won't be able to understand this tacit entente, this fraternity of adversaries whom they thought were always on the alert, fingers on the triggers. But they should think seriously about the fate of men whom a long, common suffering of dangers has brought together by the strength of an irresistible instinct of human nature. Isn't it true that, among people facing death on a ship battered by storms and in danger of sinking under the waves, all rancors and hatreds seem to abate and disappear? Where are we on the road of human progress that we have to plead extenuating circumstances for such a natural thing? But we've gotten far from outpost number nine and a half, as this emplacement of three centuries was designated on the sector map. During the next day, at around eight in the morning, the dreadful and dreaded Lieutenant Grouloir, Gruel de Bois, wooden mug, slang for hangover, came to call on us. It was he who had just surprised my successor at outpost number 10 and had him punished for the aforesaid reason. He cast a suspicious look at us, and without a word, he headed towards the group of three sentinels. He started coughing loudly, speaking at high volume, and chuckling, in order to incite the German sentries to show themselves. In fact, one of them was intrigued enough to stick up his head. Then the French officer took a sentry's rifle and, 
aiming slowly, carefully, and in a most cowardly way, sent a bullet right through his head. As a result, the Germans blasted away at us all day long with rifle shots which tore our sandbags to shreds and made all surveillance impossible. We were quite lucky that none of our sentries had his head blown off. And to think that this lieutenant was the most decorated officer of the regiment. Our sentries weren't doing their duty, he said to me severely. He no doubt was convinced that he had just carried out a most noble act. Should one complain about, or blame, or excuse, or curse those whom nature has granted such a perverse and unfeeling mentality?